amazing. Uh-huh. Whoa, look over there. Have you guys seen anything as massive as that? Great. Those cliffs are huge. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. Well, we're here. Looks like everyone else just got here too. It's time to look up. There's more to life than what's on your screen. Go off-road on the adventure of a lifetime and experience the greatness of God's love. canyons of the southwest from a rock solid faith and discover that God is monumental. I see a king in all of his majesty and splendor and glory. I see all the inhabitants of his kingdom worshiping him who sits on the throne. Listen.
I am sorry for the delay. That's true. One of our mics just disappeared into thin air. <laughs> so we're, we have evidently a little bit of magic's going on here. I hope you can echo this. God is so good. Can you say that? God is so good. Won't you stand and we're going to praise the Lord, make a joyful noise with when we all get to heaven. I love this old song. just a hint. If you like to sing, even if you think you don't have a solo voice, you come and join the choir with us. We practice on Sunday afternoons at four o'clock for an hour, and we have a good time. And it is good for you to sing. Not only good for us to sing because we're praising God, but it is good physically for you to sing. So I'm just going to invite y'all to come out. Now we're going to do, we're marching to Zion. Oh, oh, oh. 
Amen. You may be seated. My whole morning has gone like this. You know what I mean? Do you ever have a morning that's like this? Well, it just has been. I'm going to play the harp this morning, and I want to play. This is kind of how I feel sometimes. We'll work till Jesus comes, but I feel like traveling on. So I put those two songs together, and I hope that you enjoy it. I hope I play it right. Thank you.
Lena, for that special. That was wonderful. I, I had flashbacks, and I'm sure you probably do as well, of the time we made you play that in the dark. And, uh, but you did so, I, I was certain we didn't realize how dark it would be on the stage during Christmas time. Some of you were there, I'm sure, for our Christmas, I think it's Christmas Eve service. And, uh, but listen, beautiful job today. Thank you, and uh, appreciate you. And Brother John, we appreciate you, brother. Listen, you, you all are a blessing to our church, both of you. Both of you, we appreciate you so much. Our choir today, our praise team today. Listen, uh, praise the Lord. Listen, if you have your Bibles, we're in the book of Acts today. Acts chapter 10. Uh, Acts chapter 10 today is where we'll be talking a little bit about Cornelius and, uh, and also that of Simon Peter. And uh, we're just going to take some time. It's a long chapter and I'll try to hit as much of it as I can. But I, here's the main thought today is just... I hope and pray that God would just give me, first of all, because I don't want anything, I, I, I need to start this, I think, and it has to be with me, but that we would have a vision for the world. Not just, you know, we want to have a vision for our community, absolutely. A vision for our state, absolutely. Uh, for our nation, certainly. But we need a vision for the world. And, and so would you just join me and, and let's pray and just even at this time, just ask God to give us that vision for the world. Father, as we, uh, Lord, as we've gathered here today, we're thankful. Thankful, Lord, for your people. It's been just a joy even this morning. Uh, just a great time of fellowship this morning and, and the laughter and, uh, and the joy that I sense even among your people today. We thank you and praise you for that. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful uh, hymns of the faith. Lord, um, and uh, thank you for our choir, our praise team. Lord, just and, and ask, Lord, I pray that our, our worship has been pleasing to you in, in every way. Father, I pray that our hearts will be right before you, Lord, mine most of all. And Lord, I just even pray now, Lord, would you open our hearts as we look to your word? And Lord, would you speak to our hearts and draw us to you? And, and Lord, we pray Father, for those unreached people groups around the world, those that have maybe heard very little of the gospel, and, and for those that have never heard the gospel, Father, we pray for these people groups. We pray for their salvation. We pray, Lord, we're told to pray for workers for the harvest. So, Lord, we pray unto you, the Lord of the harvest, for workers to be sent out. And, Lord, now bless our time. I pray for help by your Spirit. In Jesus I pray, all God's people said, Amen. 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 Today we're in Acts chapter 10. Yesterday we had a great opportunity, some of you were there, to go down on Terrapin Creek. And uh, if you've ever wondered, does anybody float Terrapin Creek? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> a whole lot of somebodies float Terrapin Creek. And so we were able to go down and do a little outreach down there. <clears throat> Excuse me, down there. And had a great time and... and uh, and I, I just I thought of several folks. One came to my mind last night again as I was thinking about this. And, and uh, a young man, I was talking to him, and he had a tattoo. And, and, and his tattoo uh, basically said to know him. It was right here, right here, almost like a necklace, right? It said to know him and make him known. And uh, so I, I picked up on that because you may or may not know our mission statement, not our vision statement, but our mission statement is to know Christ and make him known. And so I read that, and I, and I said, hey, what, what, hey, I look at it, and I mentioned that. He said, yeah, he said, me and my brother both have one. And he said, my brother was a pastor, and he, I don't think he's pastoring now, but he was a pastor. And he said, uh, he said, me and my brother both have one, and it says to know him and make him and make him known and and I shared with him that that was our mission statement because you think about it, that ought to be what we're about right to to know Christ I hope you know Christ today and 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 to make him known right and, and our vision statement right to reach people with the gospel teach them what it means to become committed followers of Christ and then to send them right send us right into our community and into our world so so we think about these things and and I, and I was thinking about Cornelius, and I was thinking about Simon Peter. Um, I think it's John Stott that says there's two conversions in this story. The conversion of Cornelius, right? But he also says the conversion of Peter. Now, what he means by that, because Simon Peter was a Jew. Cornelius was not. He was a Gentile. 
And, and you know, most of you know, there's a little bit of, there was a lot of animosity there, but you all know enough Bible to know there's a lot of animosity between Jews and Gentiles. Now, you, talk about, you talk about the barriers that we could have today, whether it be that of, of racial or social or educational, whatever it might be, all the barriers in our, in our world today. Listen, nothing, I don't think nothing surpasses this, this barrier between Jew and Gentile. You know, Jews called Gentiles dogs, right? And certainly uh, Gentiles had no love for the Jews. They just didn't, they just, as my mama would say, they didn't jihaw. You know what that means? So what has to happen? Well, here it is. God is going to reveal himself to Cornelius, and God is also revealing himself even more to, to, to Simon Peter because, listen, there's a gospel that needs to be shared, but before Peter's going to go do it, he's got to have some heart work done. And I'm going to tell you, church, same is true with us. Before we'll ever share Jesus, there's some heart work that needs to happen, right? First of all, to know the Lord, but even sometimes to go to those folks that maybe we'd just rather not go to. Who is it today that you think is well beyond the gospel, right? Who is it today that you think, well, I don't even know if the Lord can save them. Well, let me tell you, he can. But, but there may be some heart work that needs to happen. And here's my goal. Yes, we need to share Jesus here, right here in Center, Terrapin Creek, Cherokee County, all around the state, but we need to also share Jesus with the world. I'm going to give you three things today. We're going to look at lostness, first of all, and we're going to see a lost man, and, and but we're, we're going to see lostness. We're also going to see God working and God's dealing, right, in the lives of Cornelius and also in the lives of, in the life of, of Simon Peter. And then we're going to see, listen, the old fisherman, he's obedient and he goes and we need to as well. Verse 1 of chapter 10 of the book of Acts. First of all, we see a lostness, right? And, and, and remember what Jesus said back in, uh, back in chapter 1, right? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? Well, we see the gospel spreading out. It, it was kind of an outline of the book, actually. And we see that in verse 10, verse 1 of chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now, notice it talks about this certain man of Caesarea named Cornelius, and he's a Roman soldier. It says he's a centurion, so you would think normally, right, centurions would be over 100 troops, right? Makes sense. Uh, but I also read sometimes a centurion could actually command as many as three to 600. You know, they were, the centurions were kind of the backbone of the Roman army, uh, if you will. But it says he was a, so he's a, he's a leader, right? He's a leader. He's a person of authority, right? He's a soldier. But notice what else it says about, about this man. In, in verse 2, he was a devout man. A devout man and one who feared God. So, so here's, in all his household, it says. So here's a man that has, has forsaken the Roman gods and has come to realize that there is one true God, Jehovah God. And so here's someone that, is, that fears God. He's a, we would say, God-fearer, right? He was a God-fearer. And so he's come to realize there's one true God. He's generous. He gives alms. He, he prays, right? Prayed to God always. You know, I saw a statistic uh, years ago. Most people say that they pray. It doesn't mean everybody's saved, right? But, but most people claim to, to pray. And, and, and certainly, you think about that around the world, a lot of people pray to a lot of things and a lot of other, other whatever, you know. But the point is, a lot of folks pray. Well, here's one. Here's the person. Now, notice this, and here's what I want you to see. So here's a man of authority. Here's a man in charge. Here's a man that is, a, if you will, uh, uh, just a, a good, uh, and I don't mean that there's good in him, but he's just an upstanding uh, citizen, right? He's generous. He, he fears the Lord, he prays, but he's lost. But he's lost. See, because sometimes we'll have this question that will come up, well, well what, what about those people in, 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 in Africa? Or what about those people in, in Asia? What about those people in the Middle East? And they've never heard the gospel. And if they never hear the gospel and they die, is God going to kind of make a special exception? for them? I believe his text answers that question. Here's a man 
that lived up to the light, if you will, of what of what he was what he knew. Here's a man that lived up to the light. He he had come to realize there's one true God. He he you know he did all those religious things, but he's still lost. And if Cornelius had been okay, then God would not have said anything else to him. But notice, in this passage, the thing is, the angel comes to him to send for Simon, who's called Peter, to come. Because why? There's something missing, and it's the gospel. Guys, we have got... Listen, we start saying people can be saved another way. We are just killing the gospel. And Jesus has commanded, commanded us to go with the gospel. That's the reason why we must go. That's the reason why we must share Christ. Amen? Romans chapter 1 also tells us all are without excuse. Natural revelation cannot save anyone. I mean, somebody could look outside, you look around at the the mountains or the trees or down on the creek, and and you see the beauty of God's nature, and you say, man, there has to be a creator. Absolutely. But that that cannot save. We need the gospel. And so that's the reason why uh, that, that, and you'll notice that as we see that uh, here, God sends Peter to share the gospel. There was an Ethiopian eunuch that was coming across the desert. God sent Philip to share the gospel. And God still sends you and me to share the gospel. And so people need to hear about Christ. So there's this lostness. Um, I think we have a statistic, I believe, um, about uh, the stats of lostness in our world today. Our TV's off. They may be off. But anyway, let me uh, read that to you. Um, I I, I kind of assessed this this week. So I think these numbers are up to date. Uh, in our world today of almost 7.9 billion people, um, there are 11,995 people groups, almost 12,000 people groups in our world today. Okay, so now again, remember that's not a country, it's a people group. Um, and a people group is defined as a, a group uh, with a common self-identity shared by various members. Now of that 11,995 people groups, we have uh, what is called unengaged people groups, a UPG, over 7,000, 7,364 people groups. So, over 7,000 people groups in our world have less than 2% of the gospel, or 2% evangelized, okay? So, so less than 2% evangelized. Uh, it's uh, 4.7 billion people. I'm sorry, I'm looking at it on the back screen, and I apologize, but... Um, but 4.7 billion people and less than 2%. Now, over 3,000, 3,215 people groups, 3,215 people groups are what we call UUPG, all right? Unengaged, all right? Uh, Unengaged, unreached people groups. Unengaged, unreached people groups, right? So there's 272 million people in that group. Okay, I can't, that's a big number, isn't it? 272 million people have no access to the gospel. No access. No Christians, no church, no strategy. Nobody's trying to reach them. Tom Ellip, former um, uh, uh, president of IMB, said this. He said, it's like, suppose, suppose you're in with your family. Suppose it's wintertime, and you're sitting inside, and you're sitting around the table eating a great meal together, right? You can pick the meal, whether it's chicken or meatloaf or whatever you like. But you're sitting there, and you're eating, and it's nice and warm and cozy. you got everybody gathered around you, right? It's on a winter day. And outside are all these people standing out in the cold and in the rain, and there's no plan for you to go out and invite them in. That's what it means to be unengaged, unreached people groups. Nobody's going after them. And church, listen, that ought to break our hearts. Can I be honest with you? That does not break my heart like it should. And I want that to, but there are people around us that that they don't know Christ. What happens to people who die without Jesus? They go to hell. And we ought to say that with tears in our eyes. It ought to drive us, including myself most of all, to our knees to pray that there are, because there are people that are without Christ. Amen? There's a lostness. And you don't have to travel to the Middle East or you don't have to travel to Asia to find them. Certainly, they're, they're at our back door as well, people without Christ. And we need to be about sharing the gospel. So here's a, here's a, here's a man. I mean, as far as humanly speaking, he's an upright, moral person. But he's lost. And those are hard to reach, aren't they? Those folks in our community like that, they're hard to reach. 
But listen, all of us are sinners in need of a Savior. Amen? Amen? In need of a Savior. And I'm thankful we have a Savior, don't you? Well, let's look what God was doing here. Let me move along in our story. So we see then, so what does God do? Is God worried? No, God's bringing all this together. Isn't it? Verse 3, chapter 10, verse 3. And about the ninth hour of the day, uh, this is Cornelius, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your prayers come up uh, for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. See, see, there it is. He will tell you what you must do. Again, if Cornelius had been okay, then nothing else. But he'll tell you what you need to do. Now, what, what does he need to do? He needs to place his faith in Christ, right? That's all we can do to be saved is believe. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed... Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from whom those who waited on him continually. So when he explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So we see then God appearing to Cornelius and God telling him, Hey, listen, I'm going to send you. Uh, I, I'm, I, there's something you need to do. Send men to this guy by the name of Simon. And, uh, and he's got so, there's something you need to do. Well, let's read on. So not only is the Lord working in Cornelius' heart, God's going to be working in Simon Peter's heart. Because if these guys show up before God starts working in Peter's heart, you know what? He's probably not going. Or a good chance of it. So, what does he do? Well, look at verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Notice, notice that it talks about Cornelius was a man of prayer, and here it is, Simon Peter praying. Listen, how many times has God revealed himself while we're praying? Amen? So that says we ought to be doing what? Praying. That's right. Well, yeah, it wasn't a trick question. Yeah, we ought to be praying. Amen? Everybody glad to be here? Just checking. Okay. Hey, we're praying. So, verse 10. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. I can relate to that. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open, an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, uh, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed or made clean, you must not call common. And this was done three times. And, an object, and the object was taken up to heaven again. Now, so here it is. So, so Peter falls into this trance. He's waiting on dinner, right? And, and uh, up on the roof, that sounds a little crazy, but they would do that in Bible times, a flat roof. He's up on the roof waiting, and suddenly falls into a trance. And then he sees this, this sheet being let down and all these animals in it. And the voice says, Peter, get up, go kill that hog. <laughs> Go kill whatever it is, that ostrich. Go kill all those animals, all kinds of animals, and a lot of them were not clean, right, according to the dietary laws. They were not clean animals to eat. And Peter said, no, Lord, no way. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And then the voice said, hey, don't call common. Don't call unclean what I've declared to be clean. Happened three times. So Peter's scratching his head. He's thinking, what the world? Well, listen, as we pray, as God speaks to us, we need to always watch and see what happens. Amen? Amen. Anybody, anybody ever been through experiencing God? Boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's something Henry Black, he, he hit that. Uh, yeah. So as we pray, we want to make sure to see what happens. Well, notice what happens in verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision uh, which he had seen men, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and stood before the gate. So Google finally got them there, and they got to the right place. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him again. So what does he do? As you pray, notice what God is doing. Notice who God puts in your path. Here, here is a divine in, uh, intervention, right? God is, God is intervening in the life of Peter. He's been praying, thinking, what in the world does this mean? Suddenly, here are these Gentiles knocking at the door, and the Spirit, he was sensitive to the Spirit of God. Amen? Sometimes I miss stuff because I'm not walking with the Lord. Anybody else? 
Amen. Sometimes we're just not walking with the Lord. When Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, verse 19, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to them from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the, uh, nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to this house to hear words from you. And then he invited them in and lodged them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied them. But we see God working in that. So here's the point being this, many times God's got to do something in our heart before we'll go there. I've shared this many times. I remember years ago, listen, I hate to fly. I hate to be away from home. I like being in, I am a homebody with a capital H. And I remember we had this little girl in our church. Her name was Megan. And Megan would travel down to Panama and she'd ride canoes down the rivers or wherever and go in sharing Jesus. And I know she said to me, she said, you know, Brother Eddie, it'd be really good if you'd go. And I thought, I don't think, I just don't, I, I, you know how you make excuses, right? But God had to do a work in my heart. And God had to do a work in my life. Because she was right. Pastor ought to set the example, shouldn't he? You say amen to that. That's right. And when I remember, listen, I remember though thinking, well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, my goodness, that, that would be, I don't swim. Well, <laughs> I mean, I've taken swimming lessons, but I still don't like to swim. I can't swim very good. But my point is this. I just thought, I, but you know, God had to do a work in my life to get me to that place to where finally I, I just became convinced because God had gotten so a hold of me that I needed to go. And I pray that God will do that with you and with me, our entire church, every believer in Christ, that we would go with the gospel. We can't just gather here, pat ourselves on the back, and go home. We must go with Christ. We must go with the gospel. And as scared as you might be, and as I am and was and still am at times, I'm telling you, God's doing a work in somebody's life, and they're waiting on you and me to come share Jesus. And I made all excuses. And we're almost out of time. Let me, let, me, let me move on. Let me move on. Um, and so verse 24. So anyway, verse 23, we see, in verse 23, we see the, the, the obedience, the old fisherman, right? Peter went away with them, right? And, and uh, again, if, if God hadn't been dealing with his heart, he probably wouldn't have gone. There's certainly been a lot of hesitation. Verse 24, on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Man, he's packed the pew. He's got everybody in, in the house. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up. I myself I am also a man. There may have been a day in Peter's life. You remember, listen, I believe the old boy. Listen, guys, we, we all suffer with pride, don't we? I know I do. And there might have been a time in the old fisherman's life, and I'm thinking back when he, tell, when he told Jesus, everybody else may desert you, but I won't. And maybe there was a time in his life when that old boy bowed down, he might have said, kiss my ring. Now, I don't know that he would ever said that. But, but still, he picks him up. No, no, I'm just a man. I'm just a man. Lifts him up. Uh, and then he said to him, Verse 28, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with one to go of another nation or with or, or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. He got it. He said, you know, I, I really, you know, this just doesn't normally happen. But God's been showing me that not to call anything, anyone common or unclean. He got it. The Spirit made it, got it. Listen, what is it God's teaching you today that you need to get? What is it God's revealing himself to you through your quiet time, through your time of prayer? What is it God's showing you today that, that we need to get, right? He got it. He got it. And so he's there because he got it. He understood what was happening. And let, let me fast forward. Cornelius explains why he's there. Verse 34, uh, we're just about, we're out of time. It says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. <laughs> Again, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works, in right, works righteousness is accepted by him. Uh, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. 
that the word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, which the Holy Spirit and power and went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things that he did both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him, God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Listen, here's the thing about Peter's preaching. This is good biblical preaching. You get straight to Jesus and you don't leave Jesus and you talk about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what, that's what matters, right? It's all about Jesus and Peter does that. Every sermon of Peter's, man, he, goes, he makes a beeline to the cross, as Spurgeon used to say. He makes a beeline to the cross, and he does that, and for you and me too. We could talk about a lot of things, but listen, let's get to talking about Jesus. Amen? He opened his mouth. <laughs> There's times we need to open our mouths. If you're around me, I'm always opening my mouth saying something, but I ought to say more spiritual stuff probably at times. But verse 41, he says, Not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. There it is today, guys. Listen, it's, in the, it's by the name of Jesus that we're saved. And I pray and hope you know him today. Uh, and so as they're, as they're speaking, let me just finish reading here. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that's the Jewish folks, who believed were <clears throat> astonished. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speaking with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized? Whoever see the Holy Spirit just as, as we have. Now, here it is. He's preaching the word. They got saved. And we see what happened at Pentecost, right, in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2. Here we see the Pentecost of the Gentiles, if you will. And they start speaking in tongues. They got saved. And, 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 God, and, and God was moving in their hearts. And so Peter said, Hey, why shouldn't we baptize them, right? But it says that the Jewish folks were, oh, wow, God can even save an old Gentile. Man, I'm living proof of that. Anybody else here? Probably most of us are Gentiles, aren't we? Praise God. Who is it you think is well beyond God's grace? They're not. Amen? They're not. Listen, we're out of time. We've got to stop it. Here's, here's the thing. It's a great old story. You've heard it, but uh, W. H. A. Harry Ironside. Some of you would recognize. Anybody recognize that name from years gone by? Harry Ironside. Anyway, he told the story about his father. His father was on his deathbed. And, um, and apparently this passage of Scripture was on his dad's mind. And, um, and so his dad's on his deathbed. He's, you know, not able to. He's just kind of rambling a little bit. But he keeps talking about this story. And he said, he said, and, and a great sheep, and a great sheep, and, and wild beast, and, and, and he couldn't remember the rest of it. So he'd start again. A great sheep, and wild beast, and, and finally someone leaned over. And says, and it says, creeping things. Oh, oh, yes, he said, creeping things. He said, that's how I got in. Creeping things. Listen, praise God, that's how I got in. I was an old creeping thing, but God reached way down and got me, amen? Some of you just like me, we were just old creeping things. We had no, we have nothing on our own. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling. Oh, but God's grace is enough. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your kindness. Lord, you're so good to us. And I want to praise your name this morning. Father, we thank you for the gospel. And uh, Lord, right now, I just pray and ask, Lord, that you would deal with our hearts this morning. And as we come to this time of invitation, Father, just, Lord, what is it? Just reveal that to us, what we need to know. Help us to grow, Lord, closer to you. Father, help us to see the world that is lost without you. And 
Lord, we know around the world there are many that have never heard the gospel. They've never heard the name of Jesus. But Father, we know we don't have to go that far either to find lost folks right down the road or across town, across the street, across the field. Lord, help us to be on mission with you. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray that you would do in our hearts what needs to be done. Lord, that we'd be on fire for you. Lord, what is it you need to do in our hearts today? Lord, would you do that? Would you bring us close to you? Because, Lord, we know if we're walking with you, we're filled with your spirit. Lord, we know it's going to overflow in our conversations. It's going to overflow in what we do, and what we, even what we think. So, Father, help us with that. Lord, right now, I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, if, that they would come today to know Christ. Pray for every believer here today that we would commit ourselves to you, Lord, today. Father, just to pray for the world and to be involved as you lead us. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we have a time of invitation. Our altar's open. If you need to come, you come. If you're here without Jesus, listen, if you'll call upon him, he'll save you. <laughs> he'll save you today if you'll call upon him. You come. You come as we sing. to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be? preacher calls you out. I'm kidding. Josh is my buddy. He's all our buddies. And uh, we love this, this young man. And um, Josh is getting ready to leave us. Unfortunately, he's, uh, he's going on to uh, other things, bigger and better things. And uh, he's going to be moving to Carrollton. Is that right? Carrollton, Georgia. And uh, he's going to be taking another position, another job, actually. Uh, working for uh, an optometrist, and he'll be doing some technical stuff for them. And uh, we're going to miss you, brother. And we've told him that several times this week. Listen, and I don't know if you know all that Joshua does, but I can't explain all of it. But if you, if you, anything on the screens, Facebook, videos we put out, all that, and, and much, much more, getting all my outlines and everything, he does this. Can we just let him know how much we love him? Amen. How much we appreciate him. And, uh, and so, brother, we, we're going to miss you, and uh, but we, we hope to, we wish you the best, you know that. And uh, so, I uh, want you to stay right here. Brother Gary's going to come do announcements, and then we just want to have a prayer for Josh 
and send him off uh, before we before we go out today, okay? gift bag that we would like to give to you as a way of thanking you for being here. And at the end of the service, there is a table to your left with a blue tablecloth on it. If you'll head that way, uh, we'll get a gift bag for you. Also on the uh, table today, you will find some gold-colored sheets like this. During the month of June, uh, we do our nominations for deacons. And you have the privilege of talking to someone about the possibility of serving as one of our deacon ministers and recommending them. And this little sheet is the way you do that, okay? So pick up one of those and uh, you pray for the Lord's guidance with this. Now, after the service has ended, uh, we'll have some folks in the hallway and uh, you'll see the little clipboards in their arms. We have another opportunity to memorize Bible verses. And we have uh, uh, some folks in the church for every Bible verse memorized and quoted. Uh, they'll give $5 to the building fund. We, uh, these folks gave $1,500 the last time we did this. And... Uh, so that, that is su such a nice gesture on their part. And uh, the verses are here. If you're not prepared today, pick up one of these on the table. And uh, you can memorize a verse for next week. I need uh, somebody after the uh, service has ended, <clears throat> if you would help John uh, get this heart down and uh, get it out to uh, Elena's car for us, all right? Let me pray. Yes. Let's pray for Joshua as we uh, pray our prayer of dismissal too. Our Father God, we love Joshua. He has been a super servant of Jesus. And Lord, uh, very few people in this church know the untold hours he has given in ministry preparing printed things, communication pieces, newsletters, slides, taking care of posts on social media, and much, much more. We pray that you would send him off with our love and appreciation, and we pray that you would bless him as uh, the Lord has opened another door for him. And then, Lord, we ask you to send us uh, a, a person who would do similar work as Joshua has done. And we thank you in your name. Amen. Amen.